If you go way back in time, there was actually a tradition of scientists stepping out and bringing science to the general public. So in England in the 19th century, crowds of people would come to hear physicists talk about the latest research in electricity and magnetism and things of that sort. I think there was a period though when scientists kind of retreated back into the cave of the academy and somehow there was a sense of if you want to bring science to the general public you have to water it down to a point where it's just not worth doing. And there's been a massive tide change where scientists have realized that you can talk about real science, the real ideas, you have to make it accessible, you have to translate it into ordinary language, but people are hungry to know what's happening. And once scientists realize that, they've become enormously excited about the possibility of not only talking to five other people, yeah. <laughs> but talking to the world. What drove me to try to bring science to general audiences in some sense was happenstance. I gave a lecture at the Aspen Institute for Physics, Aspen Physics Center some years ago, and people were so excited. General public, ordinary people who don't do science were so excited to know about space and time and extra dimensions and string theory and relativity and all this stuff. And it just really emphasized to me something which I already had a sense of before, that people want to know. And if you bring the ideas across in a way that's not intimidating, not with the equations, if people don't speak math unless they're trained, people will meet you and will work hard to understand the ideas. And that's enormously exciting to a scientist. I think the only way that you can communicate the most abstract ideas of science is by building a kind of bridge between things that people are familiar with and cross that bridge to things that are unfamiliar. It has to be step by step. It can't just be some sort of rapid leap from the familiar to the unfamiliar. And metaphors are a great tool for building those kinds of bridges. So I've dealt with thousands of them in the course of writing books. You know, quantum mechanics. I love to invoke a metaphor that involves currency, money because money comes in discrete chunks, nickels, dimes, quarters, and so does energy in quantum systems. And using money as a metaphor, I think helps people grasp an idea which otherwise can be really opaque and strange. You know, ideas of extra dimensions, which we use all the time. There, I don't precisely call it a metaphor, but rather using lower dimensional examples that you can picture. So we deal with things in you know, 10, 11 dimensions. Who can picture that kind of stuff? But we can all picture one dimension and two dimensions, three dimensions, and take any real ideas of, say, string theory, and looking at lower dimensional versions of them where you can draw pictures and you can actually describe them, that is an enormously powerful tool for communicating the ideas. Yeah, when we do the television shows, we begin by sitting around a, a table, not once, but for, you know, many, many hours, where we'll go through the ideas that we'd like to cover, and it's my charge in those meetings to, number one, get the producers to understand the ideas. If they're not understanding the ideas, then we're sunk. Right. And they're really smart people and they've read the books and I just sort of try to help them the final step to fully grasp what we're talking about. And then we try to describe the visuals because now we have the power of moving images. You don't have those in an ordinary book and now in e-books you do. We're just beginning to do that. And the choices that we make are in some sense guided by what is going to be the most powerful visual, what are going to be the ideas that we can describe now using the visual landscape that would be very difficult to do in words or in a book. We want to do something that really leverages the medium. We're not working on a, a television program per se, but we are working on a massive video project which is we're creating a new kind of digital course for people who may watch a NOVA program but want to go deeper, for the high school kid that wants to soar ahead and doesn't have the resources nearby. There's a great movement afoot to bring education to the digital space, 
But so far, I haven't seen anybody really make use of the digital space in a way that leverages all its capacity. So we're taking the first steps in that direction. Okay. So we're beginning our international expansion with World Science Festival Amsterdam in Amsterdam, largely because the folks in Amsterdam came to us and said, we really want to do this. We're going to find the resources to make it happen, but we need your expertise in program and content creation in order that we can have offerings that are on par with the kinds of things that are available in New York. So we're excited to embark on this first step of international expansion where programs that we spend a lot of time developing in New York can reach a different audience. Quantum mechanics forces us to rethink everything that our intuition, everything that our experience tells us is true about the world. Right? You look around the world, what are the basic ingredients that describe reality? You say where things are and how they're moving. That's it. Every physical process can be broken down into that. It's like I'm moving my hands. Where are they? How are they moving? Right? I'm blinking my eyes. Where are my eyelids? How are they moving? Everything can be placed in that language. Quantum theory says though that's the wrong language. It tells you you can't actually specify where something is and how fast it's moving. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that data is actually inaccessible. It's not real. It's not part of the real description of the world. And that means that we have to completely change our intuition about how reality evolves. String theory, there, there are two key things. One, it's an attempt at a unified theory, which is what Einstein was searching for for the last 30 years of his life. We want to have one framework that describes the physics of big things, small things, everything in between. That's the goal of string theory. Now, in terms of what string theory says, it says that at the heart of matter is a new kind of ingredient. So we know about molecules and atoms. We know atoms have electrons going around the nucleus with neutrons and protons, or quarks inside the neutrons and protons. That's where the conventional ideas stop. String theory says that there's another layer that so far we've missed. Inside those particles is something else, a little tiny string-like filament. That's why it's called string theory. A string-like filament of energy that vibrates in different patterns. And when that string vibrates one way, it may be a quark, vibrates in a different pattern, it would be an electron. So everything is unified, if you will, under this rubric of vibrating strings. That's the basic idea of the theory. It's speculative. We've never seen these strings. We don't have any evidence that they are there, but the mathematics points to this as a possibility that we take very seriously. It's very hard to determine what, if you allow me to use the word, faith, once you put into mathematics. On the one hand, the last 150 years have shown us that well thought through mathematical ideas can absolutely light the way to the next step in our understanding. We've seen this with electricity, magnetism, gravity, black holes, cosmology, quantum mechanics, particle physics. Mathematics has played a vital role in pushing the frontier every step of the way. Does that mean that all mathematics needs to be taken seriously as lighting the way to the next phase of our understanding? No. How do you pick which math is the right math? How do you pitch, pick which math you should put your faith in, in that sense? And that almost comes down to an aesthetic judgment. My feeling, based on years of working with the math of string theory, is that I'd be pretty shocked if the universe doesn't make use of some or all of these ideas. But that's just a feeling, and feelings don't amount to anything in the end of the day. It's data. It's evidence. So we hope to one day have evidence that tells us whether these ideas are right or wrong. The Higgs discovery is a big one for a number of reasons. Number one, it settles, it answers a question that has been on the table for a long time, which is where does the mass, where does the heft of particles come from, right? What do, what do we mean by mass? When you push on something, it resists your push. That's its mass, resisting your push. If you push on little tiny particles like electrons and quarks, they would resist the push too. But why? Where does that resistance come from? And the idea put forward by Peter Higgs many years ago is this. He says, look, there's an invisible stuff 
Now we call it the Higgs field. He didn't call it that. But there's this invisible stuff filling space. And when particles try to push through the stuff, there's kind of a friction-like resistance that they experience. And that's why they exhibit the heft, the mass that we measure in our laboratory experiments. Now that's a far out idea. An invisible stuff filling space, huh? Right? I mean, it sounds nutty. And at first glance, people responded by saying it's nutty. But then they looked at it, the math, and they said, wow, this makes sense. But that's not enough. You need the evidence. And it took 40 some odd years before these experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, slamming protons against protons, could jiggle this invisible something, the Higgs field, flick off a little speck, which we call the Higgs particle, that registers in our detectors. Part of the reason why it's difficult, it's a challenge to find the Higgs particle is that it is a fleeting particle. It has a very short lifetime before it disintegrates into other particles. But the other reason why it's very hard to find the Higgs particle is it is produced within a sea of other particles that are also produced in these collisions. So you really are looking for the proverbial pin in a haystack. It's this one little particle that's produced in this maelstrom of other more ordinary particles. So trying to tease through the data and see, ah, there it is, is tough. And that's why it took some very careful planning and some very powerful detectors and some very smart people right. to finish the job. It's very hard to appreciate the details of mathematics without actually doing mathematics. It's very similar if I brought you the most beautiful poem in Sanskrit. You might appreciate the symbols on the page, but you wouldn't really be able to appreciate the poem. And it's the same thing with math. It's just a language. It squiggles on a page. And if you don't speak the language, it's very hard to appreciate what those squiggles are really telling you. The thing to bear in mind is you can learn math. And you don't have to learn a lot of math to appreciate its wonder. Even some of the bo most basic things in, in number theory that I could teach, I think, with some confidence to a high school kid are so impressive in the way that the pieces lock together like the most wondrous jigsaw puzzle or really the most wondrous poem that I think most people can get that experience if they want it. I try to talk to my kids about particles and strings and all this stuff, but uh, they really like baseball. <laughs> so, uh, so we do a lot of numerical things in baseball. We play math baseball a lot, where the batter gets up and I give them a problem and that's how they get to first base or second base. But you know, I think the most important thing is give kids the opportunity, but don't push them. You push them, then they resist, sort of like the Higgs field. <laughs> and um, you want kids to come to these ideas, and if you make them sufficiently exciting, they will come on their own terms, in their own time. And I think that's the most powerful way for kids to engage science. I don't know, I, I frame it as a gift, but I would say there was an experience, frankly, a long time ago in high school, where uh, we had a course that, strangely enough, was called Hygiene of All Weird Names where they taught you how to put a tourniquet on and they taught you how to do CPR and things of that sort. Pretty useful stuff. But not enough to fill a whole semester. So they'd make the kids teach half the semester. And you had to pick your own topic and I picked dreams. The neuroscience of dreaming. And when I gave that lecture to the class, I just felt like I was connecting in a way that was getting them real excited about a subject that they never heard before. And that was exciting to me. And that was really the first experience where I felt like, hey, you know, this is something that I, I think I'd like to do more of. <laughs>